July 1943, the Eastern Front. Hitler launches an unprecedented Panzer Blitzkrieg against Stalin's formidable Red Army. We were more and more convinced that we could do it. Two armored giants go turret to turret in the biggest tank battle in history. It's just as if two bulls had run into each other. Defeat is not an option. At stake is nothing less than the fate of the Second World War. In my soul, I knew one thing and one thing only. Whether or not I die, I would stay on the spot till death and I will win. This is tank warfare at its bloodiest. This is the Battle of Kurs. Across the vast steppes of southern Russia, this bell tower stands guard over the killing fields of Prokhorovka. A sentinel at the epicenter of what was the biggest and bloodiest tank battle ever. Operation Citadel. Hitler's last gamble to turn the tide of the war on the Eastern Front. Since the beginning of 1943, Germany's once unstoppable advance into the Soviet Union has come crashing to a halt, and the Red Army is on the offensive. They've pushed the Germans back 300 kilometers. Hitler's hopes of ultimate victory on the Eastern Front seem to have vanished. In the spring of that year, he prepares for a massive counteroffensive, codenamed Operation Citadel. His plan is to launch a large-scale pincer maneuver to cut off the Soviet-held salient centered on the industrial town of Kursk. The goal, encircle and destroy more than half a million Soviet forces in the Kursk bulge. Leading the attack for the first time are the elite troops of Hitler's Praetorian Guard, three Panzer Grenadier divisions of the infamous SS, including the Death Heads. We were all under 20 or 25, and we were all faithfully German who believed in their fatherland. For the attack, the Germans have amassed 780,000 men, close to 10,000 guns, and 2,500 tanks. But the delay gives Stalin the time he needs to prepare. His strategy is to build strength in depth. To meet the expected panzer onslaught, they begin to lay mines, and thousands of conscripts dig anti-tank ditches and trenches. Their plan, to absorb wave after wave of attacks and bleed the German blitzkrieg dry. In my soul, I knew one thing and one thing only. Whether or not I die, I would stay on the spot till death and I will win. I would only be in one mood, to kill as many Germans as possible. To meet the impending German attack, the Soviets mobilize almost two million men, 25,000 guns, and more than 5,000 tanks. The Soviet war machine goes into overdrive in the months leading up to the battle. 
What the T-34s may lack in firepower compared to the newer German rivals, they'll make up for in sheer scale of numbers. And we had many of those tanks, many. I did not just like the T-34. I was in love with the T-34. Why? Because there was no tank out there that was better. I love it. I'm in love with that tank. The T-34 is the backbone of a Soviet armored corps. Equipped with a 76 millimeter main cannon and 47 millimeters of sloping frontal armor, the T-34 is a perfect balance of firepower and protection. By the early summer of 1943, the Red Army has dug in thousands of tanks, and across the vast Kursk salient, they've laid more than 400,000 mines and have prepared over 4,000 kilometers of trenches. Finally, they are ready for the Germans to attack. And at midnight on July 5th, that's exactly what the Germans do. What happened was a sea of fire, constant fire, constant shooting, constant explosions. The sound was intense to the point of blocking your hearing. Everyone, all of us are scared of dying. That's clear to everyone. But it's important to overpower that feeling. Overpower it. In the southern sector, the German Blitzkrieg is spearheaded by the SS Panzer Grenadier Divisions. Their mission, to drive straight through the Soviet defensive lines to Kursk, their right flank protected by the 3rd Panzer Corps, whose first objective is to secure a vital bridgehead across the Donitz River and to do it at first light in the face of murderous fire. We knew that we were the first who had to cross the Donetsk River, a water obstruction which we knew had steep shores and was quite swampy. In front of us were the infantry and the sappers who had already crossed the river and who had suffered a lot of losses. The Russians knew our intentions and had positioned their artillery, and we were met with huge artillery fire. Artillery fire. In the tank, we closed our hatches and we were safe. The sappers were sitting there, only with steel helmets and a whistle in their mouths. The water was as if it were boiling. That's how strong the explosions were. And they just kept doing their work and we crossed the bridge. That was no problem. But immediately after the bridge was a minefield. There were anti-personnel mines that couldn't harm the tanks. They simply shattered. But the infantry wasn't able to follow us anymore. Our second company was to our right side. And they drove over a field of anti-tank mines and the tracks of all 10 or 12 Tigers got damaged, and the tanks couldn't continue. On the right flank, the Germans suffer heavy losses, but nothing can stop the SS in the center. 
they punch a hole 20 kilometers wide and 15 deep into the Soviet defensive line. When the Skullheads came, they were afraid. We had good soldiers. We just had the reputation that we were just breaking through everywhere, that we were marching and attacking regardless of the consequences. And across the vast open steppes, the gunners and tankers of the Red Army must face the onslaught of the Tigers head on. I was a commander of the 3rd Artillery Company. In order to battle with the tanks, we would create special anti-tank defense location that were faced toward the danger zones. Of course, we always had to watch out for the Tigers. From my own observing station, we spotted a Tiger that was stationed on a high point on the field and was firing away at our tanks. It just stood there, and it would not let any of our tanks come close. No matter what we did, how we tried to go in from right or left in order to blow it up. The Tiger tank is the Germans' ultimate armored weapon. Encased in over 100 millimeters of armor, it is practically impervious to frontal attack. But it is the Tiger's 88 millimeter cannon with a range of more than 2,000 meters that makes it the most deadly weapon on the vast and sprawling battlefields of the Russian steppes. These soldiers in the Tiger were very proud. We had the best equipment that existed. It was a good tank. And for the very first time, we were head and shoulders above the Russian tanks. In order for our tanks to get Tigers or Panthers, we would have to get a minimum of three, four hundred meters and get them on their side up. You see the type of the situation we were put in? And as the Tiger tanks continue their seemingly unstoppable advance, it's not only course that is now at stake, but the fate of the entire Russian motherland. We had a heavy feeling on our souls. We were contemplating whether or not we would be able to hold them off and hold the territory. This is the modern-day city of Kurs, an unremarkable relic of the Soviet era in the middle of the vast Russian steppes. But in 1943, it stands at the epicenter of a titanic clash of arms. This is where the world holds its breath, and the fate of two mighty empires is decided. Hitler launches Operation Citadel. His elite panzer divisions slam into the Soviet defenses, and the Eastern Front is set ablaze. In a classic pincer maneuver, Hitler launches simultaneous attacks on the Kursk salient. His goal, to encircle and destroy the Red Army. Army's T-34 
T-34s are given orders to advance to meet the German onslaught and shore up a desperate rearguard defense. Their task is daunting. Stop the relentless flow of panzers any way they can. We were headed from north to south and in the river Psell, where the small streams flow into it after it rains and created many valleys. We call it Laga. Well, my tank went into one of those many valleys. It's like a naturally made trench. When I decided to drive over the edge of the trench, as I was driving my tank up, I saw a German tank directly above me, heading down towards me. I don't think I had any emotions, maybe somewhat of a fear, but I'm not sure. It was so sudden, the tank just showed up. The only overwhelming feeling I had was to get rid of it, to wipe it out or get wiped out. Every tanker knows the best place to shoot at is side iron. And also at the bottom of the tank. And only then, when I got him with the second shot, did the smoke start fuming out. As soon as he wanted to descend, I got him. That saved me. But you know, there was always fear. You can't take that away. For a full week, the Battle of Kursk rages. Although outgunned by the Tiger, the Soviets have a seemingly inexhaustible supply of T-34s, and Hitler's master plan is beginning to falter. The Tigers of the SS continue their dogged advance towards Kursk. And the 3rd Panzer Corps has been unable to break out of its bridgehead at the Donitz River. leaving the right flank of the SS perilously exposed. With urgent orders to advance, what they haven't been able to achieve by brute force, they now attempt by trickery. A secret midnight thrust straight through the Soviet defenses. It's the bold and daring plan of Major Franz Becker of the 6th Panzer Division. He was famous well-known and a valued tank commander who had a seven sense for everything that was eventually going to happen. Becker's goal was to win over as much territory as possible to reach our target. Others said, let's wait for the daylight. But he said, this is a perfect time for us to attack. And he did it. Two captured T-34s were placed at the front as a sound camouflage. According to martial law, they had been marked with the German Balkenkreuz, but they had been covered with blankets. I had ordered radio silence and no firing. Silently, we passed the first enemy barricade, moving by the deadly anti-tank guns, which remained silent believing us to be one of their own units. We were able to fool the Russians with the bubbling noise of the T-34s. Everything was going according to plan, but suddenly a column of 22 tanks appeared heading in the opposite direction. These passed my unit almost track to track. But then six or seven pulled out of the column, turned and pulled in behind us. I 
ordered the rest to continue and placed my command tank, which was equipped only with a dummy gun, across the road in order to force the enemy tanks to halt. He was bold. He was a good commander. We slipped out of our tank, unseen by the Russians. Sneaking up to the tanks, we put magnetic charges on two T-34s and jumped into cover. The detonations rang through the night. We fetched two more magnetic charges and put them in place. The blankets were taken away and we started firing at them. It was a great success for us there. We brought down a lot of Russians. Becker's gamble pays off. With their flank now secure, the SS swing right to mop up one of the last lines of defense at the village of Prokhorovka before their final advance on course. But what the Germans don't yet know is that 500 tanks of the Soviet 5th Guards tank army are blocking their way. And the biggest battle in the history of armored warfare is about to begin. the steppes of southern Russia. Today, a gently rolling landscape of wheat and rye fields. In 1943, a battlefield, offering little cover and no place to hide for a 60-ton tank. July 11th, 1943. Day seven of Operation Citadel. The SS Panzer Grenadier divisions have blasted a hole 50 kilometers through the Soviet defenses. And the Battle of Kurs is about to come to a climax of unbelievable violence. The Soviet 5th Guards tank army has been held in reserve more than 100 kilometers behind the front lines. But fearing that all might be lost in the face of the German onslaught, they are now rushed into action to the south of Kursk and prepare to launch a massive counteroffensive on the Germans' right flank from the village of Prokhorovka. At precisely the same moment, the SS swings east also towards Prokhorovka. Neither side is aware of what the other one is doing, and almost by accident, the stage is set for the deciding tank battle of the Eastern Front. Evening, July 11th. From his command post of Prokhorovka, Soviet Lieutenant General Rodmistrov, commander of the 5th Guards Tank Army, spies tanks in the distance. At first, he thinks they are advance units of his own Soviet T-34s. But then, he gets a surprise. He took binoculars and saw that those were German tanks. It turns out that the Germans decided to carry out their offensive through Prokhorovka. Events have outpaced the Soviet plans for a counterattack. Now they must prepare to meet the German SS head on. We had a very heavy feeling on our souls. By the order of the main commander general, we were to stay and fight to the death and not let the enemy take over Prokhorovka. July 12th, dawn. The rumbling of tanks' engines can be heard for miles around as 300 German tanks and 500 Soviet T-34s prepare for battle. From behind a railway embankment on the Russian left flank, Savily Ilyich commands a Soviet anti-tank gun emplacement. 
and at 0830 hours is one of the first to spot the massed ranks of the SS advancing. The entire field of Prokhorovka was covered with moving tanks. We aimed at the bottom of the tank or towards the lid of the tank. If the little cross mark was resting on either of those points, then the missile would go directly where it's aimed. It won't sway to the right or left. It'll go directly to the target. The 76 millimeter gun would have 25 shots per minute. And that's how you could battle with the tanks through direct aiming. We were learning quickly during this war. For example, we were all able to tell the difference whether it was a heavy artillery or light artillery firing at us. We were able to hear if anti-tank guns were fire shots. Every projectile made a different noise. It was very important to recognize what was firing and where it was coming from. And the armor-piercing ammo had a special mass inside it. When it collided with armor, it would burn through. Burn through and through. The Soviet armor-piercing shell has a high explosive filler designed to pierce 55 millimeters of armor plating at a distance of 1,000 meters, exploding on impact and destroying the enemy tank from within. The tank would go up in flames. Fire would burn and that's what would happen. When several of our tanks had been shot, men suffered terrible burns. A tank on my left side caught fire, and they were screaming terribly. The tankers who made it out had terrible burns on the upper body down to the belt. It was frightful. North of the railway embankment, in the center of the battlefield, tank commander Rudolf von Ribbentrop is in the first wave of the German advance towards Prokhorovka, when the Soviets take the extraordinary and reckless decision to meet them head on. What I saw left me speechless. From beyond a shallow rise, about 150 to 200 meters in front of me, appeared tank after tank, wave after wave. There were too many to count. It was a simply unimaginable assembly, and it was moving at a very high speed. And suddenly, we're on the same path, face to face. They didn't expect us to come upon them so fast, and we didn't expect them either. The SS adopt the Panzer Kyle, a wedge-shaped formation with Tigers at the point and lighter Panzer IVs at the side. Their aim to use their heavy armor to bulldoze straight through the enemy lines. Soviet T-34s lead a cavalry charge across the open fields to meet the deadly Panzer Kyle. Outgunned by the Tigers, their only hope is to get as close as possible as quickly as possible. They probably thought we would be farther off, but no. Here, there were two huge masses colliding. 
And at first, everyone was sort of confused and dumbfounded. At that second, I said to myself, it's all over now. We started killing each other, head on. July 12, 1943. In his pursuit of victory on the Eastern Front, Hitler has gambled everything on the success of Operation Citadel. And the metal of his feared panzer divisions is put to the test on the steppes of southern Russia. In the northern sector, the advance of the German 9th Army has ground to a halt, still 80 kilometers short of its objective of course. Everything now hinges on success in the south, where the SS have come up against the Soviet 5th Guards tank army on the fields of Prokhorovka. Needing to get within range, the Soviet T-34s charge at full thrust against the advancing SS. It's an all-out fight for survival, point-blank range. They probably thought we would be farther off, but no. Here, there were two huge masses colliding. And at first, everyone was sort of confused and dumbfounded. In the first wave of the German advance is SS tank commander Rudolf von Ribbentrop. My driver called over the intercom. Sir, it is all right, right. The gunner traversed right. Soon the first round was on its way, and with its impact, the T-34 began to burn. At the same instant, the tank next to me took a direct hit and went up in flames. His neighbor was also hit. We had no time to take up defensive positions. All we could do was fire. From this range, every round was a hit. I realized there was no chance of escape. All we could do was take care of what was at hand. The battlefield is a chaotic mass of tanks firing at point-blank range. For the tankers on both sides, it's kill or be killed. And so it began, shooting at each other practically point blank, 100 yards, 200 yards. You did not need a long range gun. You can just shoot head on. No one knew the situation. Not the army generals, not battalion generals, not any of the commanders of brigades. We were prepared, we were young guys. Order is order and attack is attack. But we couldn't know that a battle like this would develop, and we were just unimportant grunts. Maybe the generals might have known this, but I don't think they knew that it might degenerate in this way. It was a test of nerves for people. That's why at that age I got my silver hair early, became silver-headed. By midday, the entire battlefield has been set ablaze and become a hellish inferno. The fires were burning, the cars were burning, and tanks were burning. The field crops were burning. Everything was ablaze. It was a horrid battle. There are clouds of smoke, as if it was a dark evening. There's slaughter in the fields below, and from the skies above, death rains down in torrents. Oh. 
everyone was bombing. We were bombing, Germans were bombing. The Germans, I don't think they had targets. And that's all. The carnage is indiscriminate. Death comes from every angle. And it's the tankers who are caught in the middle. A person is scared of death. No one wants to die. I still cannot understand how my tank got hit. Either it was a bomb or it was artillery. But it burned and that's a fact. And it burned because it was totally loaded with ammunition and such. And we had extra gas. All of that burns. All of it is fire. Fire consumes everything. I decided to evacuate that tank. I said we need to evacuate, Lieutenant. The lieutenant was burning up, so he couldn't say a word. My comrade that was sitting beside me opened the lid of the tank ahead of me. Then when I was taken out of it, all I heard was the explosion. Still remember this battle. Still remember it. Only two members of Pavel's crew escape alive. Tank losses are reaching catastrophic proportions on both sides. But it's clear the Soviets are losing more. With defeat not an option, the Soviet T-34s attempt to block the German advance in whatever way they can including a desperate tactic of last resort, never before witnessed in armored warfare. Some of them had probably received the order to drive onto our tanks. It's just as if two bulls would run into each other. July 12, 1943. The Battle of Kursk has raged for seven days, and Operation Citadel, Hitler's last ditch gamble to snatch victory on the Eastern Front, is about to come to a bloody climax on the fields of Prokhorovka. 300 tanks of the SS Panzer Grenadier Divisions and 500 tanks of the Soviet Red Army clash head to head on a battlefield measuring just four kilometers by six. It's the greatest concentration of armored firepower ever yet assembled and a desperate fight to the death. The tankers of the elite SS have been prepared for the bloodiest of battles, but this is warfare like no one has ever seen before and nothing could have prepared them for the kind of tank carnage now heading their way. You have to imagine tank beside tank, one big chain of tanks. And on the other side were T-34s. And some of them had probably received the order to drive onto our tanks. Each one wants to be stronger than the other. That's exactly how it was there. It's just as if two bulls would run into each other. Except they are tanks were disabled. They themselves couldn't do anything anymore either, because they had disabled our tanks. A 
Because once they were on them, you couldn't move the turret or anything. We had never experienced that. It was the first time that the Russians had driven onto our tanks. That was their showstopper. <laughs> there were some crazy things, all the stuff that they thought of. With just an hour's daylight remaining, whoever wins on this battlefield will win course. And it's the German tankers who, in the bloodbath, now sense victory is within their grasp. We were more and more convinced that we could do it. I want to tell you something. We weren't afraid. That's wrong. So we just kept attacking and attacking. The SS advances relentlessly into the firestorm. The Soviet tank divisions are pushed back, almost to the edge of Prokhorovka, and panic now sweeps through the Russian ranks. And we just said, just like that, the lines are splitting, battalions are splitting, army is backing and we were backing up the 5th Army. But the Red Army generals won't give up. They send wave after wave of T-34s into the fight. No matter how many T-34s the Germans destroy, more and more keep appearing to take their place. Rudolf von Ribbentrop is overtaken by the avalanche of Soviet T-34s. At this point, remaining stationary was the surest means of being destroyed by the Russian tanks. Just then, a T-34 halted about 30 meters off to our right. I saw the tank rock slightly on its suspension and traverse its turret in our direction. I was looking right down the muzzle of its gun. Step on it now, I shouted into the microphone. My driver had already put it into gear. We moved past the T-34. The Russian tried to turn his turret to follow us, but was unable to do so. We halted 10 meters behind the stationary T-34 and turned. My gunner scored a direct hit on the Russian's turret. The T-34 exploded and its turret flew about three meters through the air, almost striking my tank's gun. While all of this was going on, other T-34s were rolling past us. At day's end, after 11 hours of butchery, neither side has gained any ground at all. The Germans and Soviets are back literally where they first started. The battlefield belongs to neither and Prokhorovka is strewn with the burned-out corpses of their tanks. The battlefield seemed like a cemetery of armored tanks and technology. On the entire field, on the ravines, on the edges of the forest, lay hundreds of damaged German and Soviet tanks. At Kursk, the German blitzkrieg on the Eastern Front has hit its brick wall. In the face of fierce Soviet resistance, neither arm of Hitler's pincer has come anywhere near to reaching its target, and Kursk itself remains unscathed. Losses on both sides are enormous. Operation Citadel has taken the lives of 80,000 men, and destroyed nearly 3,000 tanks. But the Soviets have held off the Germans. For the Red Army, it will be remembered as a great victory. The day after Progorovka, with news of the Allied invasion of southern Italy, Hitler calls off Operation Citadel altogether to deal with a war which is now on two fronts. The battle for course is over, and for the Germans, it represents a massive and irreparable failure. 
From these fields of Prokhorovka, they begin a retreat which within two years will take them all the way back to Berlin. For our morale, it was really upsetting for everybody. What? We're going back? That doesn't happen to us. We didn't shout hooray anymore. In a single day on these killing fields of Prokhorovka, death harvested thousands of soldiers' lives. For many, it is a place of sacred memory, where the heroism of the Red Army's tank crews saved the Russian motherland. This was the turning point for the Red Army. I remember my friends who have passed away. I'm always remembering them. Always, always will be remembering them. My friends. May they rest in peace, as they say in heaven. 